Thank you, Lucy. Um, time to open it up, uh, first for, for our members and afterwards for everybody else. Uh, the discussion could go in different directions. I mean, you suggested one, cash or no cash, uh, another the level of development of a country uh, can be very different in different countries. Um, so please, an, any question to the two presenters? Benita. Yeah, my question is to Amarjeet. Uh, it's basically not to do with cash transfers, but to do with the integrated platform that he was talking about. Uh, would it be, uh, how would you react to this statement that it makes sense to integrate at the level of planning and monitoring, and the implementation can be sectoral? We'll take a few other questions and then, please. Hi, these were great. Great, these were great. Um, I guess my questions are for Lucy, whether you could talk more both from your research and other research about how much we know about the time sequencing of impact. So how well do we know, I, I get your major point about the need for it to continue but is there any impact from early? How big is the advantage of early? Is there any impact from late with no early? Can you just walk us through the evidence on timing? <coughs> Thank you for the question, Vinita. Uh, it's not an issue of planning, monitoring, and implementation being looked at separately. Let me give you a very concrete example. For example, once the Cabinet Committee on Human Development adopted 18 indicators, for each indicator, there was a series of process indi uh, indicators as also final outcomes. Now, once the detailed uh, process act the, uh, activities which are likely to contribute to that outcome was broken up, Naturally, uh, there were various departments which had responsibilities. But the benefit is, once it has the approval of a state cabinet, then, for example, we have launched on the 15th of August our program for 0 to 3, the Bal Kuposhan Mukt Bihar program. Seeking the interventions of health department or labor department or education department becomes much easier after that. Because what is clearly accepted as straight priority is these 18 indicators and whatever contributes to the achievement of those outcomes. So this distinction of planning, monitoring, implementation is not there. Resources are departmental. Resources for say immunization will not get transferred to social welfare, it will remain with health. But what will happen is the institutional arrangements, for example, under the rural health mission they do the monthly village health and nutrition day. Now, what is it that the social welfare will do that day? What is it that the health department will do that day? So the platforms are common, the budgets are separate, but planning, monitoring, implementation, everything is together. In the sense that they are held accountable for that activity across sectors. And once the cabinet has approved the entire plan, then nobody can say that we are not a part to it. We are very much a part to it. You'll have to provide your interventions. Thank you. It's a good and difficult question. In terms of HIV risk, we're still really early days with this research. There's only about three or four studies available in, in, in the world. What we do know from Kenya, Kenya introduced an OBT cash transfer program and quite recently, and they did find impacts that in a sort of randomized cluster trial on HIV um, risk behavior. And also in Malawi and in, um, in Zomba, a randomized trial and found they compared conditional and unconditional cash transfers on, on teenage girls' HIV risk and HIV incidence. They found no difference between the conditional and unconditional. Both, both seem to work. So there's, there is some evidence that receiving uh, cash transfers, at least, in adolescence does seem to work for that. Um, but what we don't know about really is day-to-day stuff and whether receiving these these provisions to care in that at an, an earlier stage, which then might stop, would have a long-term impact. And actually, this reminds me of a, of a lecture that Larry gave, Larry Aber, in, um, in Oxford, 
10 years ago, and he might know this much better than me from the evidence of America, Larry, whether, whether early provision of, of, um, of these kinds of programs has long-term impacts even if it stops. Early. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> Ten years ago, uh, I'm forgetting. But, but, uh, I will say that uh, we did a. a con uh, I don't think the evidence is strong because there's not a lot of longitudinal evaluations following non health, non education outcomes, following mental and behavioral health outcomes. Uh, but on the theme of mental and behavioral health outcomes of conditional cash transfers, uh, we did a CCT trial in New York City, and the, the, the conditional cash transfers uh, did, did not improve. It improved the amount of time children spent on school, in, on, on, work, on academic related activities. It did not improve their outcomes, their academic outcomes. And this is consistent with the notion that if the institution isn't rich enough, the cash isn't going to make the difference, even if they spend more time. It did reduce adolescent substance use, uh, adolescent aggression, and the, the, substance, the, the substance use levels of their peers. And those substance use prevention effects were as big as uh, substance abuse prevention programs. So the cross-sectoral impact, uh, I think, is really under uh, considered in this sector. So that was a half an answer to a half the question. Okay, please. Um, yes, I have a question for uh, Mr. Sinha uh, regarding your indicators and how um, the uh, research was conducted. Um, because it's very impressive that that was done during the planning stages of the intervention and so there is more of a focus then on looking at those indicators that were determined. Did you have a relationship with researchers at a university for that or were there people within um, the government that were organizing that? And then are these results published and is the methodology described so that other states can learn from your example and, and benefit from what you've learned? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Lucy. Thank you very much for your presentation. I wanted to know if you um, had the chance to cost the care component um, and uh, also if uh, there is any information about the impact on reducing violence. Thanks. So before taking questions at the back, we'll let you answer uh, these two questions and then we'll move to you. Thank you, Esther, for your question. The background to it, uh, let me begin. You know, the, the idea of setting up of the Cabinet Committee on Human Development arose because the Chief Minister of a state had to sit in 40 different committees. Literacy had a different committee, ICDS had a different committee, SSA had a different committee, till finally one day the Chief Minister says, you know, I am not able to effectively contribute to any of them. So what do we do? It was in this context that a cabinet committee on human development was thought through because they are all interrelated in terms of their effectiveness also. The first action was 18 departments were roped in, departments responsible for decentralization, for water, for sanitation, for education, for health, for the welfare of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, for the welfare of other backward castes, urban development. And all these departments were asked to make their presentations before the cabinet committee on if we have to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, what is it that every department in the state will have to do? So the backdrop was the Millennium Development Goals. If these have to be achieved by the state, what is it that you will have to do? After those series of department-specific presentations, 18 departments were reconstituted in committees, in seven different committees, Committee on Education, like that, you know, seven different committees where subject matter was collapsed and brought together with academics also as members. Each committee was given about three months time, look at all the evidence and the data and then submit the report in the same committee, the Cabinet Committee on Human Development. So from 18 departments, seven subcommittees, seven subcommittees having evidence-based 
uh, inputs from academics and others, submitting a report, those reports again being presented to a cabinet committee, again certain suggestions, till finally the draft document is ready, where these have been defined and accepted as the state government's priorities. So I hope I am able to clarify the point that you had. Yeah. Great. These are two great questions and actually very similar to the ones your UNICEF colleagues at HQ have been asking. So clearly UNICEF does speak with one voice. Um, costing the, the care component is something that as, as we've been talking to policymakers in sub-Saharan Africa and, and up towards West Africa, they've been repeatedly saying. And, and we sort of thought that they would be very suspicious of the evidence and instead they said, okay, great, how much is it going to cost us? And I think what's really important here is to think not just about how much do these cost, the, these kinds of interventions, or making these things happen cost, but also where, does those, where do those budgets come from? And Charlotte Watts and her team at the London School of Hygiene have done some excellent work looking at a sort of bucket funding approach and showing that it, they look at cash transfers and they show that the, with the multiple outcomes, if the Department of Health put in some, if the HIV budget puts in some, if the Department of Education puts in some, that they can all benefit from the outcomes but not have to have their entire budget vanish on, on these one interventions. And I think we're, we're early days with that, but it's completely essential. The question on violence is harder, and I assume you're talking about um, child abuse and violence, yeah. So violence is a very, very clear pathway. So for example, we see that children in an AIDS-affected family have three times the rates of sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and domestic violence than children in a non-affected family. We then see that children, for example, who are sexually abused have a 12 times the odds of having transactional sex. So it's a very clear and essential pathway in this route to risk. But it doesn't seem so clear what, what cash and care are doing here. They certainly mitigate the pathways, they mitigate the impacts of, of experiencing violence. But cash alone is clearly not enough to reduce the risk of abuse happening in the first place. And something that we're trying with WHO and UNICEF, we're actually doing a, a parenting support program, a, a free parenting support program um, for sub-Saharan Africa that may incorporate a, um, a sort of financial component to see whether the, the combination um, really works better. That's going to mean a three-arm randomized control trial which keeps me awake at night. So we're going to try though. We'll take uh, questions from the back, yes. Um, so under the uh, NFSA, there's a provision for providing a cash transfer in lieu of food in case a state is unable to deliver the food subsidy that uh, the beneficiaries are entitled to. And uh, we've calculated that the maximum expansion in coverage is uh, for UP and Bihar. I just wanted to get your views on uh, how do you think this, the, the provisional gas transfer can uh, play a role in providing more food security, if not also have other spillover effects as well? Uh, I am Neerja Sharma from University of Delhi, Lady Urban College. My question is to Lucy. Uh, could you expand a little bit on the components of care? For adolescents, that's all. Uh, yes, the, the lady in the middle, uh, yes please. Yeah, my uh, question is to Mr. Sinha. I just, uh, I, uh, on one hand I appreciate the fact that you talked about care for uh, 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 children six months to three years, but what I, what I want to ask you is that uh, why do we still go on appreciating the fact that that immense work done by the caregiver needs to be, you know, re remunerated by just, you know, not even a minimum wage and just 3,000 rupees? And why are we not taking cognizance and why are some models of good practice still continuing to pay less than the minimum wage? We take a few more, yes, the row before. Thank you for the wonderful sharing. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Sinha. Um, the 18 indicators that you have talked about, uh, does it include uh, indicators for identifying disabilities and what is the plan that Bihar is doing for that? Uh, 
um, at, at the back there. Mr. Sinha, I have a question on your demand side financing improving the accessibility. The supply side financing has not helped in, uh, like, do, do you think the cash, conditional cash transfers for supply side financing, do you have examples to say that it will help to improve outcomes? And uh, if it will, then what kind of, uh, like, you know, focus on quality is important, I understand. And then what kind of method do you see there? So as to improve outcomes. Thank you. Yes, and any other question? Thank you very much. I'd like to show my appreciation for the explanation by Amajit of the platforms. This is so brilliant. We found similar mechanisms in, for instance, Kenya and Peru in a study into the governance of ECD. And these coordination mechanisms allow you to coordinate, to, to create coherence, while keeping the delivery mechanisms and the funding distinct and transparent. And I think this is really an area that should uh, explore more. Thank you. So uh, we'll let uh, Amarjit uh, respond. I think most of the questions were for you. Uh, maybe there were a few for you. So please go ahead first. I think uh, the question on food security is the most difficult one. It's most difficult because uh, ideally food again is something where the provision of food is more important than the monies to be able to buy it. Especially assuming that what will be bought in the market is going to be more expensive than what will come through by way of provision. But having said that, a public system delivering food is a challenge by itself. The kind of crafting of an effective public system which requires is a big challenge by itself. And therefore, frankly, I have no clear answer to you. Uh, unless we put in place a system which is leakage proof substantially, actual provision of food will remain a distinct, distant dream even if you don't go for cash transfers. So I think uh, clearly programs of this kind, my personal view is, they need far more preparation before we go for them. Unless or until we can actually provide for a system which can deliver what is expected. And I think this is something which applies to a large number of programs run by the government. The last mile planning is an afterthought, which to my mind is the biggest concern. Any program, if it has to succeed, the last mile has to be thought through very carefully. And again, I'd like to reiterate at the cost of being repetitive, there is no going away from crafting credible public systems. Nowhere in the world has human development happened without credible public systems whether it is health or education, any of these sectors, much as we welcome participation and partnerships with the non-governmental sector, there will, uh, the presence of a functional public system is a, a, the countervailing presence is very necessary even to determine the cost and quality of services provided by the private sector, especially sectors like health. The second issue with regard to the caregivers and the uh, monies that they get. I just wanted to, uh, one, at the personal level, I completely support the point that you've made. But again, just on the facts, the Anganwadi workers, if they get 3,000 rupees, uh, what the governments have done is that the work allotted to them is only for four hours a day. It is not a full day's work. So therefore, technically, there is no violation of the Minimum Wages Act. Technically. I am using the word technically because effectively to run an Anganwadi successfully, she needs to put in much, much more time. But the Pulwaris with the Jan Swast Sahyog is running. They are providing 6,000 rupees to the, because those centers run from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. It's a six hour day care center which they provide for the four hours. No, if, well, uh, Anganwadi come crashes are six hours, Anganwadi is without crashes are four hours. I mean, asked it. Achha, anyway, Even there I, the but rent having rent said rent. that, I, I agree with the point that you are making, that there is a case for paying more, because these are all caregivers' jobs, and perhaps you may, may need more persons in a village, the kind of care, especially for six months to 36-month people, which is required. 
the issue of uh, disability yes uh, see uh, what has happened is identification is really the biggest challenge the census gives a certain figure for disability but a large number of benefits for the differently able are based on certain defined criteria for example pensions whole lot of other scholars you know 40 percent as per a certain scale 40 percent differently able there is a certification process in many of those cases based so entitlements do not go to all those who are listed by the census and the listing by the census is not the best uh, arrangement available so I think uh, what needs to be done both for old age persons, widows as also for the differently able is what we are trying to do now is to get an actual because Anganwadi sevikas are there in every village, every hamlet in fact, to be able to get that full picture through a non-technical arrangement first and then to provide for the certification of the differently able there to be able to design an intervention which works so clearly much more work is required there but on the differently able I'd only like to say that here again just the provision of three special educators in a block does not mean that the requirements of the differently able children are met as an experiment two years ago we started with our Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyales which are there in every block in about a hundred of them we decided that besides the hundred girls who enroll we will have 25 differently able girls visually impaired orthopedically challenged deaf and what we find the finest way of mainstreaming differently able children is to put them through a residential school like the Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyalayas mere provision of three special educators in a block is not the full answer Clearly, we are not doing as much as we need to do for the differently able. I'll be very brief. Just to say about the, the components of care, the way that we found our components of care was that we, we spoke to NGOs and government before we started the survey and said, what would you like us to include in terms of services for children? We did notice that some of the services that um, the government and NGOs thought were very widespread were not actually uh, accessing nearly as many children as, as they thought. But something that we're working on now is introducing these kinds of measures of care into other studies in Tanzania and um, UNICEF studies in Tanzania and Malawi and a World Bank study in Swaziland. And there each country is thinking about what kind of care they provide. So in, for example Swaziland has after school clubs and before school clubs and they're including that. So I would really... Um, I, I'm not sure that South Africa's examples are the best ones to know. I think that this is really going to be different in every country, but really worth rigorously testing. Thank you. I think we essentially have to close. We took a little bit less than one hour, but we started late. What, what I found really nice about your two presentations is that it's very hopeful. I mean, essentially, uh, you gave uh, messages of uh, success uh, in these uh, planning committee as well as some of the programs uh, you did in Bihar and again uh, the AIDS um, interventions uh, with the cash transfers and the care really seem to work uh, at least to some extent uh, in South Africa so a number of things are working and, and this is a really great message um, before closing Kimber uh, did mention to me uh, that we couldn't give uh, the floor to everybody at the back uh, but there's a person um, uh, who is available to take a small quick interviews 30 seconds, one minute. I don't know if that person uh, can stand up. Right, uh, there. So uh, whether you are a forum member or whether you are at the back and there is something that you did want to say and were not able to, uh, you can do it uh, through these quick interviews which are going to be made available uh, on the website uh, of the workshop at the forum. Uh, thank you again to everybody.